more into automation, both manual and automation, but a big fan of automation. Uh, I try to try and figure out ways to automate things that become too rigorous for me on a day to day basis. Uh, so in that process, while I'm working on a project which has responsive website, you know what responsive website is, right? Uh, has everyone heard about it? Yeah. So while working on one such project, uh, one day I decided I can't do it manually. So then I started figuring out ways to automate it. Uh, and this talk, this talk is based on my experience on automating the responsive website. Okay, so first things first. What is responsive everyone? So I have seen a lot of heads nodding when they said they know responsive website. So any answers? Just a guess. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, the content fits the device. Can, can you be more specific? By device, what do you mean? So the, at a very high level, the definition is the definition of responsive web design as per uh, encyclopedia is, or Wikipedia is. Uh, so the browser or the website should match or should fit the content based on the end user's screen resolution or screen size for that matter. <coughs> so uh, just quickly, let's walk through the evolution of responsive web design, right? How, how come responsive web design come into picture? Uh, so if you remember, CSS was introduced in 1997. That's when websites became really popular, right? And mobiles did not come into picture until the 21st century, right? Until 2000, there was no mobile. Even though if there was mobile, there is no question of having websites on mobile. They were just Nokia T1, you know, strongest mobiles, right? But when mobile started getting the uh, ability to have internet on them, that's when people started thinking, how can we provide websites on mobiles too? Right. Uh, so for people who have been in IT for a long time, you would have known websites existing in two different domains, namely www.domain.com or m.domain.com. So whenever you're opening it on a browser, on a desktop, it loads www. And whenever you're opening it on a mobile, it opens m. Right. So this was the approach that was followed initially. So quickly, do, you, do we see a problem here? Is there an issue having two different domains? What could be the development effort or what could be the risks that are associated with it? Just quick guess. Effort is the same? Uh -huh. Do you think? But do you think the content that is rendered is the same? There, there are different contents that are being rendered, right? You cannot render the same content. Do you still think the effort is same? Yes. Exactly, exactly, right? There is a lot of code duplicacy. You have two different uh, uh, repositories maybe, uh, which has the same code, almost the same code, right? Except that few parts are visible on desktop and they are not visible on mobile, which is a lot of effort for the developers, right? Say for example, you are adding a new page to your website. You go to www. And build that website, build that page, and push that code, and the same has to be done for m dot website also. So this was the large effort that was put in in the initial stages. Now, uh, fast forward from 2007 to 2010, uh, people started realizing, okay, maybe, maybe there could be a way where we can reutilize the websites on both mobile and desktop. So that's when uh, people started thinking about grid layers, right? Instead of thinking of entire web page as a real estate. Uh, people people started looking at it as an elastic paper. So your website is no longer a static size, it's elastic, right? It's going to stretch on a bigger screen and it's going to shrink on a smaller screen. Now what happens? Because it's a grid-based layout, you need to develop your components so that they can fit into those grids, right? Is that clear question or is it too difficult? I, I, I didn't understand when I first read because it's too developer key terms, but yeah, that's how it's, it was built. But then the problem there is, right, you can do it if you know your fixed sizes. Okay, my grid size is going to be this many pixels by this many pixels. Uh, but then what happened? Fast forward from 2007 to 2010, 
mobile industry has boomed a lot. There's Micromart, there's Nokia, Samsung, uh, Blackberry, iPhone, and there are lots and lots of devices coming into market every other day and night. Can we quickly show the mobile? Everything has a different screen size, right? Now the question is, okay, we are planning to support mobile, but how do we support all these varying usage? That was the biggest challenge to the developer. Now what they started to do was, instead of just looking at it as a grid layout, they started to look at websites in relative terms, right? Instead of saying, uh, my font, uh, my say, CSS is this many pixel, they started calling it in relative terms. You must have heard it, uh, or you must have seen it in your website. They call it in relative terms, uh, EMs, or 100% of viewport, uh, say it should 50% or 30%. So it's all relative terms. Relative to what? Relative to your screen size. Right, so that's how the response website uh, or web design came into picture. Any questions so far? Or any thoughts? Right. Uh, so we are talking about the content, right? Which is fine, just the text. You say on desktop maybe it's of bigger size and on mobile it's of smaller size. What happens to the images and videos? Like nowadays we saw, we see all the websites have these fancy images, right? Open the website, the first thing you see is a big banner or big carousel with the image. So how do we manage these images on different screens? Anyone looked at CSS code that your developers have been writing? Exactly. Your name, please. Yeah, as Somshikar said, what we're going to do is we're not using the same image across all the, all the screen size. What we do is we use something called media query. So what this does is, uh, you could have different images that are loaded based on your screen size. So uh, it looks something like uh, when my max width is say 480 pixel, always pick this particular image. And when it's between 480 to 720, pick this image. Which allows you to have uh, scalable images, right? Uh, I could show you an example. Say for example, This is an event uh, which ThoughtWorks organizes. It's called World Cup, Value Oriented Discussion for Quality and this. Uh, if you see here, there's this big carousel, right, which has image in the background. So now, on a bigger screen, this is the big image that it's loading. But what happens if I shrink? Right, if you see, it's not, it's still not the same image. My focus is shifted. Now, if you see, the total image looks the same, but the content or the focus of the image has shifted to something else. And this can be achieved just by uh, configuring your media queries to fetch a different image based on the screen. Right? Uh, yes, is there anything? I, I, I quite don't get the term user agency. Right, uh, so browser will know what, uh, what size it is, right? So your CSS can be loaded based on that. sure about the implementation, but yeah, that could be one way they are fetching the screen size, and based on the screen size, we fetch the media, which is typically the media query, right? That's the response that your CSS is getting. Any questions so far? Right. Uh, so this is how the responsive web websites work, right? So you have a content which is rearranging itself, reshuffling itself based on the screen size, right? Uh, so that's it. Now. We talked about responsive websites. Uh, we talked how hard it is for developers to build a website. Now let's talk about the testing efforts, right? I mean, ultimately we are the ones who are going to say whether it passes or not. 
so what could be the challenge? Yes, coverage. Yes, coverage is a function of location. Right, okay. Okay, party. Devices, someone said devices. Yes, devices, right. That's the biggest challenge. Just because we saw so many devices in this room, right. Imagine uh, a, a website like, you know, Facebook.com, which is used by millions of people. And if your customer is someone who has a large user, user base, it's definitely going to be pain for the testers to decide how to test on this varied number of devices. And we also know that every other day there is new device in the market, new new screen sizes and new resolution. It's pretty cool. Five inch, ten inch, six inch, five inch, ten inch. Uh, so it's hard to it's hard to test all the uh, the websites and all the resolution. So how do we do it? How can we deal with it? Right. Later. Any other ideas? Decide on the viewport sizes and ta start testing. Right. Uh, so let me let me stop there. Uh, so it's hard to test on all the devices, right? We know testing is never hundred percent complete. So what we can do here is have a discussion with your business owners and decide on different buckets. What are the screen resolutions or screen sizes that that matters most for the end users, right? Uh, maybe you could say all the iPhone six uh, six. 5s and all have the same screen size. They fall under one bucket, and all your tablets fall under one bucket, and so does your large screen, your desktops or whatnot fall under one bucket. So you divide them into ranges. Uh, say 480 to 720 is one, and 720 to 960 is one, and 960 to above is one bucket. And based on that, the business has to say, okay, in this bucket, this is how my website is going to look like, and in this particular bucket, this is how it's going to look like, and so in the mobile. So maybe on the desktop you have all the content there. Best example, Facebook. Uh, so how many of you notice the ads that pop up on the Facebook? Right, right. Do they come on mobile as well? No, they don't. Right. So it's based upon what is the content that you want to deliver to your end customer. That's how you design your website based on the screen size. Right. So this is the discussion that you have with your uh, business owners to get an understanding of what is the sample set that you want to pick up for your test. Right. Now, once you have the sample set, okay, we know a particular bucket that we want to focus our testing on. Does that solve our problem? That is fine, you know. Uh, we are going into CD and CD, right? Continuous integration and continuous deployment. We say, okay, let's push to release in one week or two weeks, depending on the story is picked up. Uh, what is the problem? What, what is still not solved in the testing? We are still testing manually. We are still we are still opening the uh, website on devices, and we are trying to see whether all the content is loaded because there is no way to automate it yet. Uh, so this this delivers the interesting uh, differentiation between testing versus checking, right? Uh, checking can be done by machines, but testing can only be done by humans. Uh, so it's ultimately human judgment that's going to say whether this is going to pass or fail, right? So it, it's still not solving the problem. Dividing into buckets is not, not itself is not solving the problem of responsible design. So that's when uh, there are several things that you need to keep in mind uh, when you when you want to say, okay, my website is looking good, and I can say, okay, it can be sent to production. The first and foremost thing is uh, pages should be re readable in all resolutions. Right? This is the basic right. And the second thing is uh, content is defined important. So business has certain things that they want to be displayed on each and every resolution. For example, the website I showed, the carousel is more important. There is a register button which is more important for the website, which should be available across all the resolutions. And the menu bar might shrink or maybe not available at all, depending on the required resolution. Right? Uh, and these are the so this is no particular priority, but these are the things you keep in mind while you are testing the response. And the last one here, which is the data entry, right? Your input boxes, uh, the way it responds. So, on a website, you might have really lengthy text box, but on mobile, you have it shrink to a smaller size, right? 
when you are entering data, I usually sequence the data, are you able to see the input text that you get? So these are the things to keep in mind while you're testing the website for its for its responsiveness manual. Right? Great. Uh, moving on. So the biggest challenge here is selecting the set of devices, right? We still have to have the devices in particular buckets, and then we need to see how the frequent changes on the device. Requirements keep changing, right? People are moving towards agile, so you you need to keep in mind. Okay, if I am going to change this particular page here, I need to verify in all the resolutions to make sure this hasn't broken UI on any of the pages, right? So frequent changes of requirements is also a bigger challenge. Like I like I always mention, manual testing is is a huge effort. Uh, you can you can never be satisfied uh, with just with your manual testing, right? And someone suggested emulators. Uh, so we all know emulators are not going to give us the 100% results, right? And emulators are really good if you are testing the mobile application. But uh, responsiveness is responsive websites are a different category where you are just dealing with the websites, no more an application based. So you need not go in the way of ha using emulators and struggling with the emulators, but rather there are other ways of achieving the best results. Uh, so the my favorite tools that I have used most frequently while doing the response web design testing are these. Uh, I can quickly show you these two and we'll move on to Gallup. Browser Stack, I think we already know. Most of you might have heard about Browser Stack in Excel. Uh, so this is also one of my favorite tools. And Apply Tools is also one of the paid tools where you can uh, take screenshots of your website on different resolutions and you, ma you go and look at the screenshots and see that everything is working. Uh, so let's quickly look into this responsive web design tester. Uh, it's nothing but a Chrome plugin. So this is my website. So this is the plugin, responsive web design tester plugin. Uh, so what it does is it has a predefined uh, list of devices. So whenever you select a particular device, it's going to open open your browser, uh, open your browser in that particular screen size, and you can look at your website. Okay, it looks good, right? Uh, so there are there are predefined set of devices. You can add more devices or delete devices. Uh, this is Chrome plugin, which was there for a really long time, and then uh, Chrome became intelligent and they started something like this. So they provided a response web design tester built in with the developer tools, where you can also select the devices. You can add more devices, add more resolutions based on your uh, So this is the second plugin. Now, uh, moving on to Galen. Uh, has anyone heard of Galen before? Uh, do you want to say how or why did you start using Galen? Layout testing. Any other? Uh, so, just two, right? So, I can start from scratch. Uh, uh, so Galen is an open source testing framework. I'm a big fan of open source tools. So while there are several other manual testing tools, uh, browser stack, and ours, I started through uh, researching for open source tools, and that's when I uh, stepped on Galen framework. Uh, it was developed by a guy called Ivan Shubin. He is the person who initially brought up this idea of developing a framework just for response web design testing. And currently there are around uh, 20 contributors for Galen. It has been around for almost three years now, but uh, recently it has been gaining momentum between the testing community and the UI developer community. Uh, so it uses Selenium internally. Uh, so it uses Selenium to actually open the browser and resize the browser and do the validation on the page. Right. Uh, so how does Galen work? Uh, so Galen has something called a spec file. Like, like every language has a spec file, like you write something. Galen has a spec file too. So what you do is, first you, you come up with the device resolution or device screen sizes that you want to test on. And then you write a spec file saying, okay, Galen, if my screen size is mobile, this is how my website should look like. If my screen size is tablet, this is how it should look like. And if it's desktop, this is how it should look like. So when you, so when you
when you specify that for Galen, what Galen does is whenever you say Galen run this spec file, it opens the browser, resizes the browser for the specified frame sizes, and runs the ch uh, checks that you have done. Yes. Uh, so in Selenium, you could you could perform all the operations like is visible, clickable, blah blah blah, and all, right? Yada yada. But it will not provide you the feedback on whether the element is actually in the screen resolution at this particular height below this element or above this particular element. So Dallin provides that flexibility to test the layout instead of whether the element is functional or not. So uh, how I would approach is I would write my Selenium test to test the functionality and I would write a very thin layer of Dallin to test the layout. I would say okay my logo should always be on top left corner. My menu bar is always on top right corner, and my carousel is always below the na uh, navigation bar. And be, uh, and in the carousel, I need to see a register button. Right. So this particular layout testing is something that you can achieve using that. Does that answer the question? Uh, you could see that more in the example that we'll discuss later. Right. Uh, so this can also be used with uh, Selenium Grid, which means uh, you can just plug it in your grid and run it across different screen sizes by parallel. Right. Uh, so I have talked about Galen spec very briefly, right? So let's let's understand what a spec is. Uh, so how many of you know about cucumber? Over here, yes. Why did cucumber become so famous? Natural language, right? We are humans. We want something that we can read and write and easily understand. So Galen spec file is exactly built with the same concept in mind. They wanted to write the commands that are very readable in plain and simple. English language. It's as simple as, like I said, my menu bar should be on top right corner, or my logo should be on top left corner. So this is how you write a spec file, uh, and it has it uses very minimal text. You need not write pages and pages like cucumber events, blah blah blah, and blah blah blah, and blah. So it's very easy to write and very easy to read and understand. Uh, we'll quickly see an example of that. So yeah, this is example of Galen spec file. So that, let's just look that, look at that for a minute, right? Let's try and understand what we're trying to do. Right? Can anyone try? Let's just try and say what what we are trying to do. Right? Easy to understand, right? Pretty simple. So I said, here I am I'm defining certain objects. Right? You need to find element on the screen. So how do you find it? Using certain location. So here I said, there's a header with CSS something. So this is your this is my object. Now I am defining a section. This is like a comment for the readability purpose. In my header section, I said, on desktop, right? On desktop, header which is defined here, its width should be hundred percent. And its height should be approximately 105 pixels, right? And what happens on the mobile? If it's on mobile, yeah, width is still 100%, but my height is just 55 pixels because I don't want header to cover half of the screen of my site. Very simple, right? Very simple to understand. So this is how you write a Galen spec file. So I, here I just showed you for header. So you could write more objects saying logo or my button or carousel image, etc., etc. And then you say, okay, on desktop. This particular object should should have this particular text. Right? Any questions so far? Uh, so what we can do right now is I'll quickly show you a demo with the same Vodka website. And uh, is it visible? Right. So this is one of the spec files I wrote for the website. If you see, I have objects like Odka image, desktop navigation, mobile menu, top section, front end section, and suppose you're back talk. Navigation, uh, if it's on mobile, it's mobile menu, right? And I said the register here button, and I said the Odka logo, right? I define all my elements. Now let's see. So I defined a section called menu bar, which is this particular bar, right? 
and on menu bar i said if it's on desktop or mobile my odka image should always be visible right no matter whether it's a desktop or mobile it should always be visible the logo and on mobile the desktop navigation which is basically this part should be absent right and mobile menu should be visible so on your mobile the desktop navigation is gone but you see a mobile menu right and similarly on desktop desktop navigation should be visible and it should be above top segment i define this as my top segment so i am giving the layout of it. it should always be above the top segment and my mobile menu is absent right similarly i have defined for my top section uh, and etc etc if you see this button right i said the propose talk button should always be inside content section and its width is greater than 50% right and it's the same for desktop or mobile right so let's see we have written a uh, spec file right let's see how it looks like it show i'm inside the folder folder galen demo where it has codepa.bspec right uh, so the galen spec file has an extension .bspec so now it's as simple as galen check codepa spec and i say url equal What do you want to test for? Desktop or mobile first? Mobile. Okay. Tell me the reason. Why? And remember, we gave the tags. So these are called Galen tags, spec tags. So I say include. to see it opened the screen of the size that we mentioned in the command line and it's performing certain checks so if you see it said okay i checked for your menu bar i checked for your top section and everything everything and the result is passed so let's quickly take a look at the report so if you remember the command that i have given i said uh, hyphen hyphen html reports equals in reports directory right so if i just open This is the this is how the Galen report looks like. So it said I have run the uh, Odka G spec. I perform certain checks. So I did perform certain checks on your menu bar, and let's see what it says. So it said Odka image is visible. Let's see. So this is the Odka image. It's visible. So your test pass. Insert it. Let's remove the propose talk. So I said this section and the propose talk should be inside content. Section. So it highlights this, saying that the proposed talk button is inside your content section. So your test has passed, right? So this is how uh, Galen takes you the screenshots and tells you, okay, if it fails, it says boss, it failed. Let's let's fail a test on this, right? Uh, instead of hundred percent, let's just say ten percent, right? And this should fail, right? Uh, so, like I said. 
this gallon really uses selenium, right? Like selenium can be defined for multiple process. You can also specify gallon to run on multiple process. So that uh, I'll, I'll quickly show a test file. So instead of running this big command from the command line, right? So not too difficult. You can just I even I type wrong and stuff. Right? So let's see. So gallon also provides you the test file, uh, which looks something like this. So this is my test file. So I said. Uh, so I, I gave a comment, right? I said vodka page in mobile visualization, and it has a URL this, and the screen is really smooth that. Uh, check, like the check command we gave. This is the spec file, and include all the things that are said mobile. Similarly for desktop, right? So you could just simply run the gallon test file. It's just a simple command, right? You need not remember, okay, do I pass my URL? Do I say my screen is really smooth? Blah, blah, blah. So the same text file is there. You can also define which browser you want to run this in, right? By default, it's Firefox. You can also mention Chrome or say I or something to run on your browser. And this is data as well. Right. So any questions on that? Uh, maybe it, it, it should. I haven't tried on headless mode. I only tried it on the headless mode last time. Right. Uh, for the first question, uh, like 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 someone asked here, right? Who would you want to explain languages? <laughs> right. Uh, so Selenium. What what are all the Checks that you can perform on an element on Selenium. You could say, is it is it visible? Is it not visible? Clickable? Uh, selectable? What else? What else? That's that's it, no? Enable, right? What we are doing here is not just resizing the browser, but we are also doing certain validations, right? Which cannot be done with with your Selenium. Can can you just verify that the width is hundred percent of viewport using Selenium? Can I say my position is on the top right corner? No, you have to create a big huge thing saying that okay, this position is blah 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 and and and, and everything. So Galen has made it easy for you. That is one way if you want to hook your gallon test with your selenium existing selenium test. Right? So I would I would typically keep them separate. So I know my functionality is passing fine, but just my UI that is broken. And like I said, uh, this gives a faster feedback for your UI developers, right? Whenever they are making changes on the UI, they would just simply run your gallon test, which is very lightweight, which doesn't take much longer to run. Can I come? I'll finish off here. And they can quickly see that whatever UI changes they have made has been broken. That is already built on the existing test file. Right? So I hope that helps. Right. Right. You can do that, or you can just simply use Galen to resize your Selenium instead of calling Selenium again and again. It's either you make it easy. With Galen, or you could use something else, and on top of it, call Galen, and on top of it, call Galen. Does that answer your question? First question, and you had some other slides. Right, you can. But here we are more specifically dealing with responsive websites, right? With the mobile app, I do agree. You might have to go through the emulator to see how certain functionalities are behaving. But when you talk about websites. Uh, the behavior is going to be changed no matter what the OS is using, 
if you are on mobile or when you are on this sorry it's the browser that is going to change so when you are testing on say safari browser you can make sure that it's going to look the same on your mobile because your mobile iphone uses safari as well same goes with the chrome so you can make sure that they are going to mobile browser Yes, um, so Dalem also provides you an option to do a screenshot comparison. Uh, it's like you provide an image, a static image, and you say, okay, on this page, the entire page should look like this image, or this part should look like a particular image. I am not a fan of doing screenshot comparison, because if your text is dynamic, uh, your entire suit is going to be fake. So what I would typically do is screenshot comparison are things like logos or icons. Notifications, which are notification icons, to be more specific, which are going, which are not going to be changed. Right? These icons, you know, they are going to be the same, and they should be the same. These are the ones I would assert to do the screenshot comparison. Yes. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so in Dalton, uh, the other uh, the other thing that you get here is. any browser interaction can be written as a javascript executable command right so dalen provides you an option to write a js file with an execute script like click on this element or or submit that element or enter the text and you can save that file in your framework in your test suite and call that file before performing a particular check for example here uh, for if i want to click on something here i would just say inject and i would give the javascript file so it will inject the javascript code before performing a particular check by injecting javascript code it's nothing but you are either clicking on an element or entering the text and submitting right does that answer your question so you could also make navigation using that like a functional scenario for me rather than a layout testing right it's it's the entire user flow has been changed right it's not just the layout that has changed Just 
so that the developers are not forgetting to put the right files in there. So that's that's one thing. Uh, if you want to take a look at the calendar I just showed, uh, this is the repo uh, I have used in Guadi. You can down clone the repo and try it. Slides are yeah, yeah, the slides should be available. Other features we just saw, uh, Galen has this error reporting, uh, so it gives a HTML file. You could just simply take the screenshot, give it to the developers and say, hey, look, this is where it went wrong. And this really helped me, you know. Uh, when you when you just look at the screen, it, it seems like the box is inside the outer box, but it's not actually inside. And you wouldn't notice it, but your clients would notice it. That time, Galen helps you a lot, because you can fight with your UI and say, hey, I mean, no box, no box, because Galen helps. Uh, you could capture the screenshots and you could do the HTML file and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's pretty much I have about calendar. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Calendar also provides you the uh, option to specify the tolerance. Okay, I have this image, logo image, Orca, and I have one more image. These two images should be the same. Whole, everything, everything should be the same. So you need to provide the exact image that you want to compare it with. And uh, sometimes it might be, it might happen that there will be one or two pixel differences which you can ignore. ignore. Then you could provide tolerance for Galen saying, if it's a one pixel or two pixel difference, it's okay. Do not change my settings. That kind of thing. Yes. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, any other questions? Selenium, so Selenium is that used to Java as well. Yeah, it's built on top of Selenium. Browser actions, you can do it. Does that perform browser actions? Does that perform browser actions to Java? So, JavaScript, we are only including if you want to perform an action on the browser. Right? It's not like part of the spec or anything. So, if you want to do an action on the web page, that's when you have to. Cool, great. Uh, just, just, just an announcement. Uh, like I showed the Vodka website, right? It's Hyderabad Vodka website. We also have a Vodka coming up in Bangalore soon, which is on July 16th, which is just two weeks or three weeks more. Uh, so do visit our Vodka website, Vodka Bangalore, and do register as a registrar. So we'll be very excited to listen all the talks that are happening. I don't think you can read the text from CAPTCHA in Nubis because that's a security built on top of CAPTCHA. And Galen is nothing but just a student. What are your thanks? Uh, the easiest way to deal with CAPTCHA is put a wait, go, and just manually There is big blog on how you want, how you can bypass capture. Maybe I can share it with the audience as well. So Galen is not there. Yeah. You, you could take the screenshot, but I don't see how you could e use that screenshot to enter the data. I mean, you need some image, you need some text, and you need some screen service. I don't think that's going to help you with that. Any, any other questions? Cool, and thank you so much.